what did you most impress from this conference? Well, I, I think it's been an exciting meeting. And it was not just the, the science, uh, the education, but meeting people, meeting colleagues who are caring about the same research, interacting, and formulating new plans for the future. An interesting point was the, the very close, a very short time between the ASCO and this meeting, and probably it was also an occasion to uh, go on with discussion and also look more deeply in some data presented at ASCO. So it was for lots of subjects a rediscussion uh, about some detailed considerations about uh, ASCO abstract, and it's also useful to to be able to criticize and to and to analyze this data. So it was a kind of second thought about ASCO data. Which papers, in your opinion, were the most important presented at this conference? Well, you see, that depends of, on the standpoint. When I look at things, I would like to drive research. So I like those papers which put a good hypothesis for further research. So to me, the Dinozumab paper was very interesting. Uh, post hoc analysis on the use of denosumab versus, versus solidronic acid in patients with lung cancer and bone metastasis, hinting there might be a survival benefit with denosumab. Based on this, we really think very carefully about the new study design to answer this issue. Another important paper which was uh, uh, largely expected and awaited by the community is the, the analysis two years after the first presentation of biomarkers of FLEX trial. Uh, FLEX trial is a trial randomized to tuximab plus cisplatin vinorel being in first line in non-small cell lung cancer patients with a known benefit, very small benefit of survival of one month. And it's uh, two years that uh, we try to extract, uh, investigators try to extract from this uh, uh, population of patients a subset of them who could, based on biomarker, benefit more from cetuximab. To date, all the biomarkers usually used in this intention, uh, targeting uh, EGFR, KRAS, or uh, at the level of expression mainly, uh, or mutation, uh, have been disappointing and negative. And for they presented at this meeting a new immunohistochemistry evaluation, which can be thought as being a bit artificial because it's really uh, a scoring system which is the only one which allows to discriminate between two groups of patients. It's based on the intensity of staining and the number of, stain, of cell stains with such intensity. It was published by Fred Hirsch some years ago in GCO, this scoring system. And this specific scoring system allows to discriminate quite interestingly between patients who will or no have a positive effect, a benefit uh, of uh, cetuximab. And in the group of adenocarcinoma, for example, with a high score due to a scoring system, we can reach months, I think it was six or seven six months, months yes. of benefit of uh, survival induced by cetuximab, rendering in that subpopulation of patients with this scoring system the addition of cetuximab really interesting. So this is a pivotal trial, pivotal post hoc anal analysis, we must say unplanned because this current system was not planned to be used, which however can bring the drug to be uh, registered in some countries or tried to be registered in some countries. Yeah, I do hope so. I know it's being filed at EMEA and the data is very convincing and it is exactly what we would like to have, I think, what, what the practitioners would like to have to be able to identify the patients who has a likelihood to benefit and not use agents with all some toxicity and with costs for patients which have no benefit. So I'm really very hopeful that this will enter clinical practice. And probably one interesting thing well, as compared to mutations which we are always criticized because of very rare mutations and low number of patients, this current system really allows to segregate the population of non-small cell lung cancer in two quite balanced populations. It means it's not one or two percent of the patient who would benefit, but uh, it's a, a third of them, a, well, yes. 30 to 40 percent of them. So it's really an important population of non-small cell lung cancer patients who could benefit from, from this drug. Uh, being a new alternative uh, between the other ones to treat them in first time. Other papers you were impressed of? 
Well, I, I've been waiting the, the uh, papers from the so-called Paramount trial, which is a trial investigating maintenance treatment with Pemetrexed after induction treatment with platinum Pemetrexed. And uh, what was seen, we have seen the progression-free survival data, which has been positive for maintenance. And of course now people await what will in one or two come out and the overall survival and on this study. But it's another hint really that we have to reconsider maintenance treatment for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. There were also UTOC uh, data presented. Were they different from the ASCO data or were they all the same? Um, to the detail of UTAC, they were mainly the same. Uh, I think they added in the UTAC some quality of yes. li life uh, data, which were in line, I must say, with the other quality of life data we have for this uh, customized first line treatment in mutated GFR patients like IPAS, in which you could show that uh, uh, having patients dramatically responding to a drug uh, better than chemotherapy, I mean, will improve uh, over uh, quality of life in these patients. So I think it did not bring very new information or striking news uh, in the field, but just reassure us that even if there is a rash, even if there is a rhea, patients responding at the level of the tumor is a benefit for their quality of life. So I think it's in line. Yes, I think it's a very important issue. It's one of the few areas where quality of life studies in lung cancer really have contributed to our knowledge. And it's the fast response the ease of use and the better quality of life. So there's no doubt that in a patient who has a tumor with an EGFR mutation, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor is the first choice. Yeah. The question of the UTAC answers is that till now we had four four published uh, randomized trials, but all were concerning Asian population of patients. And of course, there's no reason to think that biology between Asian and Caucasian EGFR mutated patients should change. However, we know for chemotherapy, for example, that the biology of uh, different ethnicity of patients is not always superposable. So this UTAC was confirming that globally, really, the PFS uh, in all these uh, randomized trials published to date in Asian or Caucasian patients is the same uh, and uh, the same benefit can be reached uh, in both population of patients. Are there papers on the way which will uh, change clinical practice in the near future? Maybe there was one interesting trial performed by the BTOG British Thoracic Oncology Group, which was, it's a kind of old trial, which it could have been performed 20 years ago, like trying to know if you should deliver cisplatin or carboplatin as for first line treatment in non-small cell lung cancer. Question was also the dose of cisplatin, because some advocates that you should give more, more is better, and some advocates that it's no use to give such toxicity to patients based on a, on a regimen. So this was a randomized three-arm trials with a carboplatin at an AUC of 6 uh, with gemcitabine or cisplatin at uh, a dose of 80 or 50 milligrams per square meters. Um, and uh, it's important to know that to, to say that carboplatin was the dose was, uh, it was calculated uh, with a corrected formula to obtain the AUC value which was um, uh, described as uh, uh, mainly increasing 10 to 15 percent of the median dose of carboplatin. Uh, we will have to go through the details of that because it's not the Cockcroft and Gold formula we usually uh, use for, for calculating that. The conclusion of this trial is that you can deliver carboplatin gemcitabine with the same efficiency as cisplatin uh, gemcitabine. But if you want to use cisplatin gemcitabine, you have to use a use normal dosage of uh, 80 milligrams per square meter of cisplatin because there was a trend of uh, diminished survival, reduced survival in the lower dose of cisplatin. I think it does not answer brilliantly a question because the only proofs we had about the difference came from meta-analysis and never single trials. But it gives us some, some, I mean, some more data to say that the toxicity pattern should be also discussed according to every patient, to my opinion. I, I, I do not interpret that all the same. I think to me the only firm thing this shows is that 
what we have known long along, if you reduce a drug below a reasonable amount, you have a worse outcome. Yeah. And this has been known for in the past, even with small cell lung cancer, sure. there were studies. And uh, like the carboplatin, I would not immediately translate that to the clinic because I think the dose reduction with carboplatin is even much more significant. So if a physician says six, mm -hmm. but this may be 6.5 mm -hmm. because the formula was different, mm -hmm. and then you adjust for the vial, mm -hmm. and you adjust for this, mm -hmm. I think I think more this puts patients in danger. Mm -hmm. we, we have to really be careful. Uh, I must uh, agree that we have to go in details with this data because few oncologists deliver an IUC of six yes. uh, of carboplatin and even more if this IUC of six represents 20% more than the usual IUC of six. So probably the toxicity of such a regimen could become competitive with the toxicity of cisplatin. Yes. So we have to go more in the details. But the conclusion of the authors was that carboplatin was a standard to first-time treatment um, of these patients. So this is something which reopened maybe somehow the discussion about it. When it comes to diagnosis, should we test more the uh, genetic uh, makeup of the tumor, or is that already done uh, regularly? Well, there's many consensus papers, and you know ESMO has put on a consensus report that today, if a patient has a non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, we do need to provide the best treatment, uh, molecular analysis. But this is moving very fast. Many of us uh, are involved with, with ALK on trial with uh, crisotinib, and many of us have a mandatory task to the pathologist to also look at ALK in the patients. And this will move. And of course, it's not the same in clinical practice and in the re research setting. But for those in the resource setting, it's very clear you cannot do any more clinical trials with pathway-driven drugs without in-depth molecular analysis. The future will be probably to be able to build a large co collaborative groups um, uh, and, and trials based on a large enough number of patients to be able to prove that other targets are valid and other drugs are valid in the setting. I'm thinking already about the BRAF mutated patients, which is a very rare mutation. However, however we have the drug, uh, which is now to be commercialized or registered for melanoma, but this cannot be done in Switzerland. This cannot be done neither in some centers. It has to be done through large collaborative groups, also for credibility in face to, 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 to discuss and argue with pharma. So I think there are next steps, ne next steps which are not basic di daily diagnosis, but to be built in order to, to implement new uh, customized treatment, hopefully in first line for these yeah. patients. And you could also say that in ETOP, we, in the European Thoracic Oncology Platform, we have put together such a collaborative group to really try to give answers to the challenges on the future, which includes over 35 centers in Europe, is ever enlarging, and we have a project called uh, Lungscape. It can also be seen on the internet, lungscape.org, which tries to address this question of molecular typing tumors and the new ways of doing research. Do you have a take-home message from this conference? I have one. You want to? No, no. no. <laughs> it's time passed for people trying to cook their own soup in their kitchen. We can only move in collaboration. And it's not just collaboration between medical oncologists. It's collaboration with scientists, with pathologists. I've seen great things in radiotherapy development. Mm -hmm. At the center, every time is the surgeon because he takes out tissue. So, uh, yes. People have to move in collaboration, and this was quite clear here. And I guess the same applies to clinical practice in the hospital, in the small oncology uh, office? Well, there, there I, I don't know, because I, I, I would then say yes, if you have your own not so large office, you need to be connected in a network. Mm -hmm. So when there is a question, you need to be able to take the telephone and not mm -hmm. wait and you know for a letter and say, and 
discuss this question within the networks? I would say yes, essentially the same. And even more, I think now that we, we are entering uh, an, uh, an, an epoch in which um, it's become more and more complex, to, to, to put a precise diagnosis uh, of a non smoking cancer patient due to this mutation, due to the new drugs. It's very important that, uh, in particular in the case of the patient who has not the profile of the usual smoker, lung cancer, uh, that we are in, in re close relationship with this uh, private practice doctor in order to be able to, to deliver the good drug, to, 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 to give the good diagnosis, and to potentially enter these rare patients into protocols. I think in my region it's well done because we are close, we have close relationship and we can discuss it together, but I think it should be built because it's our rare patient who can really extract a benefit from having a, a very specialized advice in the field, which of course cannot be done by a general medical oncologist who has so many knowledge, so much sure. knowledge to have across oncology that he can know, cannot know every detail of non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.